Good morning. I am telling you, there are people here playing tricks on me. I said, where's Lynn Latham? I think she's got the prelude and she's not over here. And we're all looking around and finally she said, oh, she's over there. She's over there. <laughs> I miss one Sunday and people start being mean to me. What are we going to do about that? No, I am so glad to see y'all this morning. We had just a little bit of rain, four or five drops of rain. So we're, we're still praying for rain, but uh, glad you could come out and be in the service this morning. The flowers are beautiful. Sharon and uh, Larry Lively's 55th wedding anniversary. We want to remind you that we're still having men's Bible study in Fellowship Hall, 7.30 in the morning. And um, I don't know if you are able to go to this meeting. One of our missions that we support in our chapel, and it's not really a mission, except that it is a mission during this time of year, is the fire department. The, the White Bluff Volunteer Fire Department is amazing, and it is run by volunteers. They had a meeting yesterday with essentials that you need to know due to the heat and the lack of rain. So we have some little packets that are left over from that meeting that are in Fellowship Hall. If you don't have enough, or if we don't have enough and you didn't get one, Terry Pierce or Bill Pierce are your people to see. Terry's back there waving her hand if you don't see her, but contact me, I'll get you in the right place. So um, I wanna remind you too, for those of you who are new, uh, when I say new, like in the last 10 years, our first, because <laughs> we are 20 years old, uh, our, our first associate pastor was Jack Horn, and Jack passed away this past week, and his family is going to have a time of remembrance in our fellowship hall today at 1230 for Jack and his wife Joyce, who passed away several years ago, and so uh, we just want to, those who knew Jack and Joyce might want to uh, enjoy just a time with the family and uh, just some sandwiches and snacks in there, but wanted to remind you of that. Uh, also, our food bank has some needs. I sent that out in an email on Thursday. You can drop it off here, or we would love for you to come see us at our new offices at the Palms and drop it off there. So glad you're here. So glad as we can get together and worship this morning. It's always a great day when we can worship our Lord. So uh, before we have our sneaky prelude over here, let's bow in prayer. God, we just thank you for this congregation and these people. We thank you for this community. God, we are um, so blessed in so many ways, even when we have hard, difficult days and hard, difficult times. It's just so encouraging to know that people are praying for us, that people care about us, and that you are right there. Some people believe in horses and chariots, but God, we believe in you. And we are so grateful that you sent your son to die for our sins. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's a great question. The choir just asked, how can I keep from singing? All the things God has done for us, how he has blessed us, how can I keep from singing? So I'll pose that question to you as well. Let's stand and sing. Give the Lord our praise. Join us and sing. Praise him. Praise him. Thanks for letting us come here today into your house to worship and we lift up our songs and our praise to you and ask you to be with Randy as he brings the message and accept our praise as we lift up our voices in song, Lord. We ask you to uh, bless this community and beyond and Lord, we pray that the face of this nation will turn back to you. We pray for you will bring peace and throughout this world over there's so much war and strife 
We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, Lord, and he is our hope of peace one day. Forgive us for all the times that we have failed you. In your name we pray. Amen. in the storm we belong to you there will never be a place where your light can't find my face. No valley that's too deep for love to see. When temptation whispers low, you won't leave us all alone. Your spirit in my heart will carry me. We belong to you. That's a really, really easy chorus. It says, we belong to you three times, and you will never leave us as orphans in the storm. So join me on that. Ready? We belong to you. We belong to you. You will never leave us. Thank you, Paula. Well, what a week it's been for myself and my family. We were able to uh, move from Tennessee. We went out and uh, picked up all of our belongings, made it all the way out here to Texas. I really, really appreciate it. I wanted to say thank you to all the gentlemen that came over and ladies to help us unload. It took me and uh, some of my buddies out in Tennessee about six or seven hours to get loaded up. And we had about 25 guys show up at our house here on Friday. We were done in less than an hour. I was amazed. It was amazing. And so, uh, but, but, so if you didn't have a chance to come and help us unload, uh, that's okay because there's a lot of opportunities to help us unpack. And so it, uh, it, we, it was great last night. It was our first night in our new house. And so I was able to, uh, to spend the night there. And it's a process. All of you throughout your life have moved different times. It takes a while to get settled in, but we're well on our way. I appreciate your prayers. Uh, just as we transition and uh, everything's going super well, it's great to be here. Be looking forward to something. Uh, I've had a few meetings with our children and youth workers, and uh, we've got some really, really cool things in store uh, for this fall. You'll be hearing more about that in the weeks to come. But there's one big thing happening in September that you'll be hearing more about in the very few weeks to come. We'll have some back-to-school kickoff events for our children's ministry, for our youth ministry, and super excited about those. 
And so we don't have a date locked in just yet. We're very close to that. When we do, we'll let you be the first to know. But be in prayer for those ministries as we get ready to ramp up for the fall for our children, for our youth. School starts in one month. And so it's hard to believe summer just flies by. And so school starting here in just a few more weeks. And looking forward to a great, great fall kickoff with our children and youth ministries. Well, Paula, that song fits perfectly into our next song. Belong to you, into all to us. And so this is a newer song. It's by Chris Tomlin. I introduced you to the choir this week. They're going to help us lead it. But let's all sing together. The words are there in your bulletin. Great, great lyrics to this. All to us. Jesus. 
Today's scripture reading is 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. If you'd stand with me and read, let's read God's word together. For God who said, let shine out of our darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power is from God and not from us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And while we are standing, let's offer up this next song as a prayer to God, asking him this morning to speak to us in a special way. Join us and sing Spirit of the Living God. Let me say, first of all, thank you for all those who decided to wear the color of the day. <laughs> so, try to get it all coordinated. We won't do it every week, but, but this week we're, we're good. This past week, I, I googled the phrase, useless stuff. <laughs> Things that you can buy. Did you know that you can buy a bottle of diet water? Diet water. I believe it's also gluten-free, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> you can buy a package of camouflage golf balls. <laughs> why? Why, why, do we, why would we want to do that? I don't know. You can buy a pet petter. It's a machine that pets your pet. And the subtitle on the package says, Never touch your pets again. Yeah, I was also glad to see that they still sold a, a pet rock. Nothing like a good pet rock. But the most intriguing to me was the, the useless box. And maybe you've seen something like this. There's different variations. Uh, so, uh, one version is a simple switch that when you turn the box on, there's a, a little deal that opens and a hand comes out and turns the box off. <laughs> on and off. The definition of a useless box is a device which has a function, but its direct purpose is deliberately unknown. Yeah. So this morning, as we continue through our, our series, the, the Pictures of Strength, we, we are looking this morning at the, the useful vessel. And Paul gives us a series of pictures and, and ideas of what strength is and strength and grace. And, and today we look at the use, useful uh, vessel. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to that. If not, we have pew Bibles and you have your phones and, and that's fine too. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, 
useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Now there's a contrast between verse 14 that uses the word of no value or it's useless and and the idea in this passage where it speaks of being useful. In chapter 4 of the same book in 2 Timothy, Paul uses the word again when he says, pick up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful for me in ministry. So this morning, let's examine that together as we think about that useful vessel. How how can we be useful for the Lord in the gospel ministry? How can we be used for the glory that he has for us? So the picture that Paul uses is a very common picture, both then and also now, of the idea of a vessel. And this particular vessel is a household container. It refers to plates and cups and platters and bowls, anything that is used in the house. Now, Paul says in this great house, in this this particular house that he's speaking of, there are objects of gold and silver, there are those of wood and clay, and there are other materials. But the focus is not upon the material of the vessel, rather its usage. In any house, there are things, and some of your translation have the word honorable and dishonorable. There, there are vessels that we put front and center for all those to see, and, and some of those we put behind closed doors. So think about your household. Think about what you present so that others can see. It can be those, again, cups and, and plates, and some of those are, are fancier than others. You may have a china cabinet that you bring out now and then, the fancy china and and all the utensils. And you have those things that when you serve a meal, um, when you prepare something, you you bring all those out. And they are, using Paul's terminology, they are honorable. They are those that you want to have seen. There are other vessels and other containers that we have that would be considered things we kind of leave behind the closet or behind closed doors. It would be the waste paper basket. It would be the the trash can in the garage. It might be the cat box that you want to have out of sight. There would be some things you wouldn't eat out out of, like the dog bowl. You would never want to, to confuse the two. There are those that are honorable and those that are dishonorable. You you want to be sure that you eat your breakfast cereal from the bowl out of your cupboard and not from the dog dish. You want to prepare your casserole in a casserole dish and not in the cat box. You, You want to mix your ingredients in a clean mixing bowl and not in the bathroom trash can. You, you, you get the idea. <laughs> there are things that you don't want to mix. There are certain things that are proper and certain things that are, that are useful and they have, have a purpose, but not something that you would want to mix with one with the other. So as we think about the vessel and we think about the, the, the usage of the vessels that God has given us, there are three things I'd like for us, for us to consider. One is that we are called to have a, a clean vessel. The vessel should be clean. Every vessel, every container, every dish, every cup, no matter if it's made out of gold or silver or ceramic or wood or or clay, it will get dirty. When you use it, it gets dirty. It needs to be cleaned. Now, there are some things that we take and we we put in the dishwasher. Some things we, we wash by hand. There are some things that get so grimy and encrusted that we have to scrub it and make sure it's fully clean. So as we think about the clean vessel in the spiritual realm, we know that the cleaning of our, of our souls, the cleansing of our lives is through Christ Jesus a, a once and for all experience, a once and for all time that we say that Christ is the Lord of my life, that there is one who who has saved me, that that, that Christ came, that we read from Genesis to Revelation, the promise of a Savior. And through Christ Jesus, he is the the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but but by him. That we know that we come to Christ, that we come to him, and there is that, that spiritual cleansing 
that comes upon us. But we also know that as we live in the world, that there are things that can, can get us a bit um, dirty as well and, and filthy. In fact, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this particular letter in 1 John is written to Christians. The focus here is not upon the salvation cleansing experience, but, but rather examining ourselves to ensure that we maintain a, a proper relationship with him. It's that, it's that ongoing um, sanctification process that we, we come before the Lord, we, we look at the mirror of God's word, and we ask ourselves, am I doing the things that God desires me to do? Am I the person of faith that God desires me to be? So we have a, a cleansing. Now, I noticed some things about cleansing, about cleaning things. First of all, it, it's hard to tell if something is clean when you're in the dark. It's hard to tell if something's clean when you're in the dark. Think about your morning routine, and maybe this has happened to you. I don't know what time you get up in the morning, but let's say it's early morning. Maybe it's dark. Um, maybe, um, maybe there's just a dim light outside. You, you get up, and you, 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 you push the, the coffee maker to, to make your coffee, and, and, and then you come back, and you, you get your cup, and you, you pour your coffee, and you, you sit at your nice, easy chair, and uh, you read the paper, or, or you look on your phone, or you read a magazine, or, or just whatever it may be. You're trying to wake up, and you get through with that cup of coffee, and you go to the kitchen and to, 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 to put it away or to put it up, and, and, and you look in the cup, and you didn't realize the bottom of the cup is filthy. It was not fully clean. Now, now you're looking at me like that's never happened to you, is it? <laughs> am, am I the only one that's ever happened... Yeah, yeah, there's something, it's like, oh, that good, it was good coffee, but a bad cup. And I'm like, this, this, I have a sickening feeling right now, just wondering what was in that cup. We all have been there. We understand that it's important for us to be able to, to have the light, to be able to tell if something is clean or not. In fact, we read just a moment ago in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, and I'll, I'll read part of that beginning in verse 5. For what we preach is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have in this treasure in jars of clay to show that all surpassing power is from God and not from us. You see, the only way we can tell if something is truly clean is by shining the light upon it. The only way that we can tell if our lives are, are fully uh, cleansed in the, in the presence of the Lord is to, is to hold that glass up to the light and allow the light of Christ to shine. And if we see some smudges and some dirt and some, some grungy stuff in the glass, we know that, that we need to come back to our prayer closet. We need to come back to coming before the Lord to confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that, that we know that there is a cleansing that comes as we, we immerse ourselves in the presence of the Lord. The second thing I noticed about clean things is that just cleaning the outside is not enough. We, we're very familiar with the passage in Matthew 23, 25 through 26, when Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders and, 
and also to you and me, that reminder that we are not just to, to look good and to have an outward appearance of goodness, but there is a cleansing that is an inner cleansing. We don't just clean the outside of the cup. We clean and allow the cleaning of the inside of the cup. It's not enough for us just to come to church on a Sunday morning and, 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 and look good and, and wear our, our peach shirts and, 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 and be, be sharp looking. We, we, it's more than that. It, it goes beyond that. It goes to our hearts. And, and even though we, we put on the church face, if we're not careful, and, and then we leave, we, we forget that God knows our hearts. And God knows what's within us. And we ask ourselves, am I, am I truly cleansed? Is God able to use me Evalu- evaluating our cleanliness through his eyes so that we can be useful to the master and prepared for any good work. Another thing I noticed about cleaning is to have a proper cleaning, it must be done in a proper way. Our lives can be cleansed by the grace and mercy of our Lord. In fact, one of the beautiful pictures of, of baptism is just that. It's, that, it's that, that, that the spiritual cleansing that we have as we come to Christ. Any other attempt to have a clean life is a, a cheap substitute. Um, you may have heard the story. It's an older story about a man who um, constantly showed up at his neighbor's house right when it was time for dinner. And, and he would show up and talk, and finally the, 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 the man and woman of the house, they'd have to say, so we're about to eat, do you want to eat with us? And he'd be like, oh, okay, that would, be, that would be super. Well, the wife was a little bit perturbed about it because she was making all the preparations and, and preparing the food and having just enough food for the two of them. And so... She had a plan. So one day the man came by, and sure enough, he decided to stay and, and, and ate dinner with, with them. And so the, the wife took the plate and put it on the floor and allowed the dog to lick it clean. She then took that plate and put it directly into the cupboard. For some reason, that man decided not to come back for dinner. (laughs) And and let me just say, too, and and I just realized, I've I've said three things about dogs. I love dogs. (laughs) I I do. I I love them. They're great. We've had dogs. But a dog cleaning is not the same as a a cleaning in the sink. We're, We're all agreeable with that, right? Yeah. So there's an honorable way and a dishonorable. There's a right way and a, and a wrong way. Spiritually, true cleaning can only come from Christ. A, a true cleansing can only come from Jesus Christ. There are other cheap substitutes that are out there. There are other ways in which the world will say you can come clean in this way. But the only true Cleaning is through Jesus. And just as clean, clean, cleansing comes to the grace and mercy of our God, we ought to share the gospel also with those clean hands and a clean heart. Whether we're at a, at a restaurant or in our home or someone else's home, when you eat, you value not only the food that is served, but also the cleanliness of the cup the plate, or the bowl that it is served in. So if we are vessels of the Lord and we have the truth, the pure truth of God within us, the the picture that Paul gives of, of the vessel is that we are to be able to present the truth in a way that is pleasing to him. Now, does it mean that we have mistakes, that make mistakes? Does it mean that we have difficulties and we'll never come to a place of perfection upon this earth. But, but one of the challenges we have on a Sunday morning is we come to worship 
is to be able to sing those songs of faith and to be able to word and to ask ourselves, am I being the man and woman of faith that God has called me to be? As we wake up on a Monday morning and as we, we take time to open God's word and take time to allow that word to speak to us, am I being the man or woman that God has called me to be? We come and we, we prepare ourselves for the good work. The third thing I noticed about cleaning, or the fourth thing I should say, is we need to watch out for a cross-contamination. Mixing dirty water with the clean, or picking up a clean plate with dirty hands. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Or James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We are to be clean vessels to be used for him, evaluating our cleanliness through his eyes so that we can be useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. To be a clean vessel. The second thing is to be a chosen vessel. In Acts chapter 2, there's a calling of Paul from being a persecuting Pharisee to being a devoted follower of Christ. And, and the it, passage says in Acts 2, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this is my chosen vessel to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. He says to, to Ananias, he says, Go to this person, go to this person, Paul. This person is my chosen vessel. My chosen vessel. Now that applies to Paul. It applies to those believers in the first century, and my, my friend, it, it, it applies to you and, and to me. We are chosen vessels. We have been chosen to proclaim the work of our, of our Lord. We have been chosen to, to come to Christ, and we have, have had the opportunity to be able to accept that free gift of salvation. We have been chosen to, to, to lead our families and to be the faithful followers that God's called us to be. We are also chosen, I believe, to be at the White Bluff Chapel at this time and in this place. And as we talk about the challenges and opportunities and the, the growth around us and the ability to, to look at children's ministry and youth ministry and, and other family ministries, we, we are chosen, I believe, for, for this time and place to be able to come before the Lord and to be able to say, Lord, I just simply desire to be a vessel to be used for you. And that involves so many things. <laughs> And things that we don't even know about, that we do know that God truly is working in our midst. And I'm pretty excited about that. The third thing that we see, um, not only a clean vessel and a, and a chosen vessel, but the idea of a priceless vessel. There's a passage of scripture that, that many people like to shy away from until you know the true meaning of it. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands... In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker vessel. Now, there were some that would push from that in the idea that, that why, would, why would a wife be, be, be weaker con compared to, to her husband? I had a college professor, a Greek professor, that kind of opened my eyes to this particular passage. He said that in his house, there's a, there's a room, and in the corner of the room, there's a little pedestal, and on that pedestal is this, this antique, very fragile vase. And, and the, the kids and the grandkids, they could play in the, all the house, but in that room, they pretty much were told, don't roughhouse around this vase, because that vase is precious. It's priceless. 
what, what Peter is saying in, in that passage is, for husbands, we need to treat our wives with a, with a preciousness. They are priceless to handle with care because they are, are a gift that God has given us. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And I don't know any woman that would say, I don't like that idea. <laughs> Precious. I, I think we could expand that a bit as well as we, we think about the people that are in our midst um, and that we are called to handle people with respect. And to handle people with, with, with care. I believe God tells each of us that even just as we care for our household items, just as we care for those that, that, that are in, in the household, that we are called, to, um, we are called to, to look at each of those items and each of the people in our lives as priceless gifts. You ever been in the living room and somebody's in the kitchen washing dishes and all of a sudden you hear a glass break? <laughs> Your very first statement could be, are you okay? Is, is anybody hurt? Anything I can do? But you, your question could also be, after everything is settled with the individual, is what broke? <laughs> what exactly did you break? You see, um, your level of concern and grief directly corresponds to the value you place on the object. If, if, if the glass had been in the family for generations, or if it's a, a special glass that, that is irreplaceable, your, your grief and your concern could be, could be pretty strong. If it's just an everyday glass, no big deal. Things break. But there are, are breaks that, that there is no way to, to be able to, to glue it back together. And believe me, I have tried to glue things together that I've broken before. Not glasses, but other things. And I thought it was a pretty good job until Susie asked me, what did you do? <laughs> and I realized it wasn't so great. But when you break a glass, if you're like me, it shatters everywhere. And all you can do is you pick up the bigger pieces and then the little shards of glass. You may have to get a paper towel and try somehow to get it. And you, and you throw it in the trash. And, and then you look around and you see some more on the floor. And you got to pick that up. And it could be hours or even days later when in your bare feet you step on a little piece of glass and realize you didn't get it all. You see, there are people all around us that they, they, get, they get broken. There are those that, that are shattered. And there are those that the pieces are just, just lying out there. But the miracle that we have in the picture, and, and if you're here this morning wondering if God truly loves you, the, the incredible picture that we have of the gospel story is that God is able to take all those broken pieces and shards of glass, and though we could never even think about getting it back together, through the miracle of God, he, he recreates. It, it may look a little different than before, but he recreates that and forms that into, into something beautiful. There's no throwing in the trash in, in God's kitchen. There is that recreation we are precious in the sight of God the pieces may be there and yet they will be picked up and recovered why is this because we are precious in the sight of God there are no throwaway people there are no throwaway situations. We are precious, and, and God takes us as we are. You see, we're not simply used as pawns in the service of our Lord. We are precious in his sight, and there is nothing that he desires more than to see our lives lived to the fullest. And sometimes 
and, and something that, that we can only experience through his grace and through his mercy. May the church never be seen as a useless box, something that has a function, but its direct purpose is deliberately unknown. Let his church be full of clean vessels, chosen vessels, priceless vessels that are fulfilling the purpose and why we exist, one that is clear and uncompromising as his light shines through us, living and telling the world of his grace and his mercy that we experience day by day. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. We thank you, Lord, that as we do so, that we rejoice in your presence. Father, guide us to be the vessels that you have called us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to continue to keep your head bowed and eyes closed as we have a time of reflection. As we close our time of worship today, I invite you to either sing these lyrics or to just read along and follow these lyrics, as I hope we leave today inspired and challenged, asking God to give us clean hands. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord, we cast down our idols and give us clean hands. And give us pure heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. And give us clean hands. And give us pure heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that sees. I seek your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that sees. I seek your face, O oh God of Jacob. And give us clean hands, and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday.